Oh, I'm Gary Pinnell, and I would like to study with you in Mark chapter 6 today. It's a rather long chapter, and so we're going to need to do a lot of reading as well as commenting. So let's, let's go ahead and get started. And I uh, just let's just pray father just thank you that for your word to pray that you'll speak to our hearts as we go through it today and that we'll understand the things that you want us to understand we pray all these things with thanksgiving in jesus precious name amen all right mark chapter 6 jesus as a servant of god all right judy lord bless you sister all right mark 6 and let's start right in here it says, then he went out from there and came to his own country, Nazareth, okay? I've been there. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, Saturday, he began to teach in the synagogue. Remember we said that that was the, their... Well, they didn't call them churches in those days, but that would be like us. They would be like the church building and the synagogue, which they built wherever they had at least 10 Jewish men, they would build a synagogue. He began uh, to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands. So they had heard about all that Jesus had done. Is this not the carpenter? And by the way, in those days, carpenters did more work with rocks because the houses were built with uh, kind of a, a soft rock that you could chip and cut and build and and that's what they mainly did they may have worked some with wood but mainly with rocks so he was probably a very strong looking man is this not the carpenter the son of mary now uh, joseph had uh, passed away by this time because he's not mentioned and brother of James, so he had a half-brother, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. So how many brothers? Four brothers. And are not his sisters, it's plural, they usually mention the names of the sisters, sisters, plural. So at least two sisters, could be more, here with us. So they were offended at him. Okay. Now, it is very, very tiring and difficult to try to uh, get people away from traditions. Traditions. Um, that's on the Fiddler, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, a movie. Uh, the Jewish people, traditions. Well, I can say that about Christians and people in the church. If you would ask the vast majority, well, definitely Catholics and Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and many, many other people, they would say that she, uh, that Mary was always a virgin. She never had any other children. And that is just wrong. Uh, and hopefully that as you're following our studies, you realize that I'm one of those people that I take the word of God at face value. I look at what it has to say and I follow it. And because of that, I will tell you, there are people that are friends of mine uh, that will not even continue with us because they're so used to, I believe, traditions. And uh, we, we Christians don't even realize how many 
traditions we follow that are not. Now, tradition is not bad if it's something that is true and something that God has indicated that we should do, like forsaking it up. The assembling of yourselves together and so on. That's important. That's a tradition that we need to keep. But we're talking about beliefs that are wrong, just wrong. And uh, that is in thinking that Jesus was always a virgin her whole life. They never had any children. It just gets through right here telling you who the, she ha Jesus had four brothers, gives their names right here, and at least two sisters, probably more, okay? And those were, of course, his half-brothers and half-sisters because Joseph was not Jesus' father, God the Father in heaven, and Mary was his mother. Uh, it was Mary was the virgin because that it was a miracle that God did for her, for the only woman in all of time, uh, she was born, or she had a child without having an earthly father. And so she is, a, we call her the Virgin Mary in that sense, but not because she never had any children. She did have children, and they're talking about them right here. So she was not a virgin her whole life. She was a mother uh, like any other mother, and uh, so that's why they're talking about uh, the Jesus brothers and sisters here that they had grown up with. And then so they're uh, indicating that he's not important because we know who he is. He's not uh, the Messiah or anybody special. He's just the carpenter's son, which he was not the carpenter's son. Okay. And uh, so that part they didn't know. And the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. Judas was a pretty common name in those na days because of the tribe of Judah. All right. And were not his sisters uh, here with us. So they were offended at him. So they had grown up in Nazareth with Jesus' brothers and sisters, not knowing that they were half-brothers and sisters. Verse 4, But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Which is true. Uh, a lot of times uh, people will not think that God could use you in a special way because they know you. And you're just like us. Well, we are human, but you know what? God does use people in a special way. Uh, I think in the past, uh, like Oral Roberts and uh, Billy Graham and uh, uh, Dwight L. Moody and R.A. Torrey and on and on the name goes of people that are common people, but God used them in a mighty way. Verse 5, <coughs> excuse me. In this case, Jesus is more than human. He's both God and man. Verse 5, now he could do no mighty work he, there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Why? Because they didn't believe that God could do mighty miracles through him. Verse 6, and he marveled because of their unbelief. This is the God of the universe marveling at how he knows that people can have unbelief, but then this is this is something else. Uh, he has just done thousands of miracles in other places, and then he comes home to his hometown, and they don't even want to believe that he can do uh, the things that he has been doing. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. So there was uh, order in the way that he went about reaching all of Israel. And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two, which is a good method. And some people, well, we can't do that because the Mormons do that. No, it's all right to have two people together. And uh, uh, the Mormons have a wrong message, but we have the right message. We should be going out sharing the message. And he gave them power 
over unclean spirits so they could cast out demons. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff. Now another one, another mission trip that he sent people out with, he told them to take something with them. So it just, it's just this case and no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. So they're just to go out and trust the Lord. He would help them as they went out as missionaries, uh, supply for them in every way. As he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. So don't go with the people that, you know, oh, well, these are richer and that, no, and these are more popular. No, just go to the first place that you go to and stay there. And whoever will not receive you uh, nor hear you when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. All right. So if they were not going to hear the message of the Messiah, of the God of the universe who had come to visit them, well, then uh, too bad for them. Um, uh, so be it. That's uh, You've heard the gospel and you've had an opportunity. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. All right. Now, sometimes people on the average hear the gospel message seven times before they receive it. But who's to say that you could have more than one opportunity to hear the gospel? So they went out and preached that people should repent. And uh, hello, Kathy. Good to see you, Emmanuel, Pastor Emmanuel from India also. Lord bless you folks. Okay, so they were to preach repentance. That is still for today. There are some evangelicals who say, oh no, we don't teach repentance because that would be like works or something. No, uh, repentance is still what God has said to preach and that souls would be saved. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Now, I really believe that as we go out with the gospel today, these are examples for us as to how we should minister. I will tell you that when we went as missionaries with uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship to Trinidad and Tobago, um, I was very green, in other words, very inexperienced, and I really, a lot of things I didn't know, and I didn't realize that the people were still demon-possessed today. I mean, that's how little knowledge that I had, but when we were there, we are able to do that. We are able to have crusades with evangelists, KK, and, and uh, uh, we saw many people saved, lives changed, and and so it was wonderful uh, and um, reached out to many children and young people and trained people to teach the word of God. And that's what we're supposed to do. And today, that's the same thing. And uh, so then, now King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known and he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is the prophet, uh, or like one of the prophets. Now, Jesus was a prophet, uh, but he was the prophet that Moses was talking about. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. Now you see how he had a guilty conscience and you have to read the other passages, uh, but it does mention briefly here the other parallel gospels that talks about that too. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, 
his brother Philip's wife. Herodias was her name, and she was Philip, his brother's wife. But because King Herod was king, he just took her, and she was willing to do that, of course, uh, for he had married her. Okay, but John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. We're supposed to teach the gospel. We're supposed to teach the truth. And if somebody is living uh, wrongly, and even in our time, we should speak out against homosexuality. We should speak out against abortion. We should speak out against people that are worshiping idols and doing uh, sinful things. Uh, we should not be ashamed of the truth and of the Lord and his righteousness. And so uh, that was what John was doing and he got beheaded because of that. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him. If you have bitterness in your heart and unforgiveness, it's murder, Jesus said, and it will lead to murder wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and a holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Um, then an opportune day came uh, for Satan, actually, uh, when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias's daughter herself came in and danced, and it was, I believe it would have been an immoral dance and something that was um, attracting the men and, and um, showing off probably a lot of the body and so on, a seductive dance and danced, and of course, of course Satan can use those things in people also and tempt them and pleased Herod and those who sat with him. The king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. What a foolish man. He also swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. He was probably drinking too. And so she went out and said to her mother, just to show how wicked her mother was, uh, not just because she was an adulterous woman, but the wickedness of her heart. What shall I ask? And uh, she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she just wanted his head cut off. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Now, old King Herod, he never thought even that such a thing would happen, but now he's in a pickle. Uh, he's caught between the horns of a dilemma, we say, because if he does one thing, something is going to happen. They're not going to, well, you didn't keep your word. And, and then if he doesn't, then... Uh, his wife and his daughter is going to be upset with him. And the king was exceedingly sorry. You know, it's hard for us to imagine how degradation of heart can take place in humans when they are following Satan and his, his wishes and listening to the things of the world. Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went out and be beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. It, I mean, it's just hard to imagine such horrible uh, things. But this is what happened. This is the truth and reality. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And of course, then they went and told Jesus. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things. Of course, he knew that. But uh, as they told him about it, both what they had done and what they had taught, and he said to them, 
come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. It is, he needed um, to get alone with his father. And we need to get alone with our father when things happen, when uh, people die suddenly, when there is uh, disasters. When the, We need to get alone. And the apostles needed to get alone uh, with God and pray. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat thousands of people around them. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran there on foot from the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. Now they would have been on the Sea of Galilee. It's not very big, and it'd take longer to go on a boat across it than it would to take to run around it. Um, and Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because there were they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Can you imagine? It had been so wonderful to have been with him. Uh, but we have his word today, and it's so wonderful to study it each day. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread. <coughs> Excuse me. For they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Okay. Well, that's that's good, but that's not good enough for... <laughs> uh, thousands of people. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and fifties. And God always does everything decently and in order. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven. God always prayed before he ate. Um, blessed and uh, and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. So he broke them, gave them to the disciples, and they broke them and gave them to the people that were there. And in their hands, they were expanding, even as they did that, and multiplying. And two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. They only counted the men, so, and they all traveled together as a family, most often so you would have the wife and at least uh, one or two children or more. And so you're talking uh, 15 plus thousand people. And immediately he, and then notice that he just, um, Jesus took what they had and multiplied it. He didn't create it out of nothing. He could have, but he is uh, not creating right now, but he is multiplying what we give to the Lord. And that is a lesson in itself, isn't it? But we're going to have to move on because of time. And so... Um, and so while he sent away the multitude then, go before him to the other side. Um, immediately he and his disciples got into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida uh, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to uh, the mountain to pray. Remember, John had just been beheaded and... and um, he wanted to spend time in fellowship with his heavenly father. 
Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing. And um, so it, it just, you can see that he is in the spirit and looking out at what's going on. And for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed by them. I like how Jesus is a gentleman. Uh, he doesn't uh, knock down the door of our heart. He knocks on the heart uh, heart's door. He doesn't jump in the boat. He goes as if he's going to walk by. And people have a choice uh, to invite him in or not. And uh, walking on the water is nothing for him. He created the water. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. <coughs> no, fear is not of God. And uh, they're fearful. Um, and uh, there are such things as uh, we, people call them ghosts, actually. There are uh, familiar spirits. We've talked about this before, fallen angels that pretend like people and so on. So they thought, oh, maybe that's what it is. But then they realized that it's uh, Jesus. For they all saw him and were troubled. But they'd never seen this before. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them and the wind ceased and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. Now you can go into more detail what happened in the other passage, the other scriptures, <laughs> uh, parallel passages of the Gospels. Verse 52, For they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. In other words, uh, now he's going to talk to them about the... Uh, the uh, yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, but they thought he was talking about uh, because they hadn't brought bread and so on. And it talks about that in the other parallel Gospels. And verse 53, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret, and anchored there. Now remember, he's been there before. Remember, that's where the the uh, guy that was called Legion, because he had like 2,000 demons in him and so on, break the chains and everything. He had been there before. And, he, and this man, when he was healed, he uh, the demon was cast out. He wanted to go with Jesus because he had become a believer. But verse 54, and when... They came out of the boat immediately. The people recognized him. Now remember the last, for, the last time they had sent Jesus away because they were fearful because the the swine, the pigs had been running to the tree, uh, the ocean and uh, drowned in the ocean. But but now they receive him with open arms because this man had gone before and shared his testimony, how that he had been delivered, and uh, the people all knew him, and then uh, many were saved as a result. Uh, verse 55, ran through that whole surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. And so as a result, thousands more were healed. And wherever, and demons cast out, wherever he entered into a village, <clears throat> and the lepers also were cleansed. Cities or country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces. They couldn't do that in Nazareth because the people there didn't believe, oh, this is just uh, Jesus, and uh, his brothers and his sisters are here. Um, and begged him that they might, <clears throat> excuse me, just touch them, the hem of his garment, in other words, this, the bottom of his garment. 
and as many as touched him were made well. Again, thousands upon thousands were healed. Uh, our time is up for today. I have to be, uh, I need to go to a prayer meeting and uh, other places, but with the Lord's help, uh, we're going to continue to share God's word and let's just go to the Lord in order of prayer. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for all the wonderful things you're teaching us as we study your word. Pray that you'll help us to put this into practice. And we love you. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and those around the world that are suffering for you. Pray all these things, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Lord bless you, brothers and sisters in Christ, and we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow. Shalom.